this, which is today's lecture. So, you know, let's say you want to get really serious, we as a culture about stopping the rise of, you know, global greenhouse gas emissions, um, but actually getting to the point where we're seeing those decline, you know, how do you even go about that? It's like a global undertaking. And specifically, what do we need to do? You know, more wind, more solar, more solar, just how do we go about it? So today we're going to be addressing that, not in an individual way, like with minimalism, but as a culture, as a planetary culture, as a species, what do we need to do? Where do we even start? How do you prioritize these things? So before we do that, let's have our first eye clicker poll, which I will initiate here. Poll, yes. Select, close this. Um, so we're gonna talk about three things today, personal action, collective activism, being politically active. Um, the question is with the first thing, this kind of goes to minimalism, would you consider making some sort of personal action regarding all this? And again, there's no you know, judgment here. I'm really just curious and it is anonymous. So what would that be? Like switching to a large free plant-based diet, forgo owning a car, limiting air travel, becoming a minimalist. There are a whole range of things you can do. So have you already thought about this? Have you done this? Have you done one or more would be A. If you've done just one would be B. You're really thinking hard about it. You haven't really thought about it at all. Or yeah, you're not really buying into this at all. So let's just see. Most people are thinking about it. Good, good, good. A small minority um, not doing anything. Another minority, but really three times larger, anyhow, people that made more than one such action. And the top two, um, doing the math in my head, not quite as big as the third group, but yeah, okay, that's good. Let me close this if I can, go back over here and on with the lecture. So there are two ways of approaching this issue about reducing greenhouse gas emissions, one personal, one global. So let's start on a personal level as we've heard all these things. And that's what I was just asking about, like switching light bulbs, unplugging phone chargers, all that. So what about this approach? Is it a viable approach? Is this going to get us there? Is this going to, to help? Is it the way to do it? So in other words, should everyone here just vow to make personal action? Will that solve the problem? Um, it's a fair question, but I can tell you right now, no is the answer, kind of a spoiler, but we'll go through it. In this um, great book, Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air, which you can get as a free PDF download, um, late David McKay drew attention to, uh, he's British, so he drew attention to BB News suggesting that nuclear power plants will all be switched off in a few years. How can we keep Britain's lights on? The answer, unplug your mobile phone charger when it's not in use. Um, and as McKay notes, it's certainly a good thing to do. So one of the things you could do, personal action, you have that little power brick thing. It used to be like with iPhones, like a little sugar cube. They're bigger now, but unplug that when you're not using it. Why? Because some of those older generations actually used energy even when there wasn't anything plugged into it. So McKay addresses this, um, which is a good meaning idea, you know, and the BBC is suggesting it, but <sighs> obsessively switching off the phone charger is like bailing out the Titanic with a teaspoon. Do switch it off, but please be aware of how tiny a gesture it is. Let me put it this way, and again, I'm quoting Andrew McKay. All the energy saved in switching off your phone charger for one day is used up in one second of car driving. So the point here is we need to look at the relative merits of these things. Yeah, unplug your phone charger, fine. Turn off lights, fine. But we need to look at the really big issues here. And car driving, as I mentioned before, and we'll mention today, and I mentioned no doubt in days in the future, um, that's a quarter of the average American's, the average US citizen's um, carbon footprint. That's huge. And if you, you can do all these little things, but you gotta really think about the big things we need to do and start lining them up in terms of what's more effective and what's not. And that's what today's about, lining them up. So what are the big offenders in terms of our individual climate footprint? So again, person, taking this from a personal level, what are they? 
So um, they're good sources online. One is the ever reliable Union of Concerned Scientists. They put together an article on this. You can find a link to it online. And um, I'll walk you through the basics of it here today. So number one, biggest thing you can do is housing. For the average US citizen, it's a third of your climate footprint. Especially if you live in a large or suburban house, Really, if you live in a supersized house like a McMansion, it's huge. What's causing that? Heating and cooling and general home energy use. Heating and cooling are a big thing. And it depends on not just the size house you live in, but where you live. So the average person living in Alaska has twice the climate footprint of someone living in the lower 48 states because it's just so much colder there, requires a lot of energy to heat their houses. Uh, the flip side is places like Arizona and um, Florida have very large footprints because of cooling them. In fact, if you would have asked someone uh, 70 or 80 years ago, they would have told you that Arizona was probably uninhabitable by people. It was just wouldn't be possible. But air condition came in, solved that problem. Huge population in Arizona now and other such places, but huge um, energy drain because of it. But in general, Housing is a big issue. So if you want to address this personally, think small, you know, um, think tiny house, think micro apartment, think shared living. We're going to look at all those options later. But yeah, number two, transportation. I just said it, 25% of your carbon footprint probably comes from having a car. Just driving around is, is really big. I would also note and if you paid attention to the uh, pre-recorded lecture I had a week or two ago, air travel is also huge. If you're an average American, maybe not that big, but if you travel a lot, it can double, triple, quadruple your climate footprint. Um, half of Americans never get in a plane from year to year. 19 out of 20 people on the planet never will get into a plane. But if you fly a lot, transportation can be huge. It can, can outstrip everything by a long shot. So stuff, this is what the minimalists are concerned about, what Vance Packard was concerned about in the waste makers, um, tangible items like clothing and furniture to services, um, which all have a carbon footprint, getting a haircut. Uh, healthcare has an absolutely huge carbon footprint. Um, and there are other things that you can't have access to individually, uh, but that would be something like the military. Military in the United States has a phenomenally huge carbon footprint. Other countries have a fraction of that because they're not you know, interested in having a military the way we are. But anyhow, um, if you're interested in approaching it personally, yeah, stuff. Minimalist, you know, mandate, consume less stuff. Um, founding out, finally, rounding out the big four is food. Um, you're going to see this with cowspiracy. Extraordinary amount of greenhouse gas emissions, probably around, if you're an average American, 15% or so of your emissions. But it varies. If you are on a largely plant-based diet, if you're vegan, it's going to be a lot less. If you're doing like Atkins or Paleo and consuming a lot of meat, especially beef and lamb, it's going to go up. It depends. And that's just for the US because, well, we eat lots of meat here. Other countries like um, Bangladesh, which we saw on the true cost, yeah, so they consume far, far less. And we're going to actually see those numbers. It's, it's pretty striking. Anyhow, um, if you address these issues by you know, getting rid of your car, living in a smaller, more efficient house or co-housing, eating a largely plant-based diet, you know, all this, um, you could probably at least cut your carbon footprint in half. So if you wonder, you know, what can you do, you can bring it down significantly. And in fact, one of the um, documentaries we're going to have is a friend of mine, Peter Kalmus, who's a climate scientist down at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And as an experiment, he did all that he could. And since he was in a, since he was in a good position to um, figure it out, he realized that he was able to cut it, his carbon footprint to one-tenth of the average Americans. And um, it's, it's, it is possible to do. However, there's this other issue. If you don't approach it personally, but globally, you know, how do you do that? Um, so the reading for this week is Project 
drawdown, which is arguably, and this is their quote, the most comprehensive plan ever proposed to reverse global warming. So if you wonder, is there a plan out there? Have people been thinking about it? Scientists and, and technology people and cultural experts, have they been thinking about it? Yes. Do we have a plan? Yes. This is probably the best one going. It's available free online. You're going to be reading from it. Um, it considered and ranked the 100 most substantive solutions to global warming. If enacted, these 100 things could not only halt the rise of greenhouse gas emissions, but actually ultimately draw down GHG emissions. And that's because of projects like agricultural projects that would literally suck the CO2 out of the atmosphere. So yeah, here it is. You wonder how to do it. It's lined up for us, 100 things. And you know this is what we need to do as a species. Um, all 100 are needed, but the top 25 are particularly noteworthy because, you know, if you take the top three solutions uh, alone, and we're going to look at those in a minute or two, um, they're equivalent and actually would do more than reduce than the, the bottom 75 things to do. So the top 25, especially the top few, are really important. The others aren't so important, even though you might have heard that they were really important. So like in that bottom 75, for example, is, big surprise, electric cars. They're not that important. They just are not imp that important in terms of this. And in fact, when you go through the list, you'll see that things that we would just take so for granted because they're like obvious things that anyone could do are bigger than electric cars. Certainly mass transit, yeah, bigger. But um, carpooling, carpooling is bigger than electric cars. Why? Well, most cars, three out of four have one person driving around in them. If you have three or four or more people in a car, that reduces it dramatically. Um, what may be surprising is that although there are things like that, like switching to LED light bulbs and electric cars and things like that, many of these things, you know, um, you've never heard of. And the things that you would think would be there, like electric cars, aren't in the top of the list at all. So... Um, Switching to energy efficient light bulbs, we're often been, we've been told this for like 20 years, um, it can make a meaningful difference in our climate footprint. Um, you always have to do the same thing we did with the, you know, the little phone chargers, take the relative impact into account. Um, if we were talking about globally reducing food waste, something you may not have thought of, if, you, if someone asked you, what can we do for the climate crisis? Reducing food waste may not have come to mind. Change it to LED light bulbs may have, but food waste is five times bigger than switching to LED light bulbs. Don't get me wrong, LED light bulbs are really important and they're important across the planet to electrify the planet, get people um, with lighting and all, and especially because people are, are dying because they have like kerosene fired uh, lamps in their homes across the planet. But relative merit, food waste is bigger. Um, I mentioned electric vehicles, they're almost like the iconic thing, you know, so if you ask most people, what can we do? I don't know, wind turbines, solar, electric cars, these are the number one thing. Electric cars are number 31 on the list. They're not even in the top 25. So what your assignment is, is to read the top 25. So if you get through all 25 and you think, well, wait a minute, where are electric cars? You'd have to keep going down and you can do it. It's all available free online. Um, but, you know, the number one solution, um, which I'll get to, I kind of already spoiled it, but in a minute, is, um, is rarely mentioned in the press, even though electric cars get a lot of press. In part because, well, you know, no big surprise here, people are trying to sell you electric cars. You have folks from Elon Musk down that are basically car salesmen intent on selling you cars and can't, intent on making you get rid of your existing car and buy their new car. And they're telling you that it's this great, you know, thing. Um, well, let's look at the numbers and just see. Um, the maybe the most surprising thing, the number one thing, actually the top Free. Um, but the number one thing that we can do to roll back greenhouse gas emissions doesn't involve wind turbines, solar panels, electric vehicles, or any similar sort of technology. Again, if you come at it from this techno approach, you may just, you know, mindset, you may have had blinders on thinking that it's going to be new technology. But if you look at the actual numbers and the folks who have done it have concluded 
differently. Number one thing when taken together is wasting less food and eating a largely plant-based diet. It's actually one and two on the list now. It's bigger than anything else as 167 gigatons of greenhouse gas emissions would be reduced. It's far bigger than wind or solar. And the surprising thing, and I'll get to in a minute, but kind of a spoiler, the number one thing if you tease them out is less food waste on the planet. Below that is eating a largely plant-based diet. Those are the, the two things. They are bigger than anything by a long shot. And if you think about it, what's so, so, so this actually in some ways encapsulates the problem of the course or the problem of our culture today. Um, neither of those requires any new technology to speak up. Yeah, we need more affordable and better like containers for food, things like that. But for the most part, we have all the technology we need to do that right now. So what's the problem? People are unwilling to make the cultural changes necessary, change their behavior. And that's all that it takes. And it sounds so easy to say it and yet so hard to do it. And if you don't believe me, try to convince all your friends to stop eating meat or convince even a bigger challenge, I would argue, convince older generations like my generation to stop eating meat. I think it's you'll find it's really hard. And everyone wants changes to be enacted that don't impact us in any significant way, right? So an electric car is the same as a regular car, right? I mean, you get to do all the things you did in the regular car. You might complain a little bit about it doesn't have the range or something, but you don't have to change anything. And you turn on your electricity in your house, you turn on a light bulb. Who cares if that comes from solar or wind as long as it comes? Um, but to tell people they'll have to make changes, that's difficult. So yeah, food waste is the single largest producer of greenhouse gases on the planet, full stop. You know, um, many people, maybe you do have, and you're gonna get it when you watch Cowspiracy, have gotten the memo that a largely plant-based diet would have profound climate consequences. It absolutely would, but food waste is considerably larger an issue that receives very little press. And by the way, just to be clear about this, it exists in different ways across the planet. And basically we waste somewhere between a third. Well, let me continue and then I'll launch into a more deeply thing. Part of the problem is that waste, we waste between a third and a half of the food that we produce on this planet. Um, for Americans, for, for most of us, this happens at the consumer level or right around it. So what I mean by that is we either waste food we leave it on our plates, we buy food that we never eat and it goes bad in our refrigerator or whatever. We go out to dinner, we don't take the food home. That's part of it. The other part of it is it gets, re, um, it's a problem right at like supermarkets and all. A lot of food has the best buy dates. And when those pass, they have to get rid of it, even though it's still fully consumable and all. So that's that's a problem. And and. You know, for other parts of the world, uh, well, I'll get to that in a minute. But let me just re clear and repeat what I said. If we just stopped doing that for Americans at the consumer level, so this is something that we can do. It's not that we have to revamp the whole, uh, you know, food system, but we just have to act differently and remake our relationship to food. Uh, we'd cut the single largest source of greenhouse gas emissions on the planet in half. So it's absolutely huge. Um, I know it doesn't sound as glamorous as self-driving electric cars, but um, when you look at the numbers, this would be 10 times better than electric cars for the planet. And by the way, in other parts of the world, it's different in so far as they don't waste food at the consumer level. If you look at that in parts of the world where they don't have much food and people are actually starving or, or billions of people are food insecure, um, they consume almost all the food that they get their hands on. Maybe two or three percent isn't. But the problem is they don't necessarily have a good food um, system in place. So they don't have good refrigeration. They have trouble transporting it. They have problems with containers so that, you know, um, um, pests like rodents and all can get to it and all. Um, so it's a different situation, but also in a pretty simple situation to resolve and a relatively inexpensive situation to resolve. And it's also the case that across the planet, but especially like in the US, we only consume 
the food that we want to consume. So if you think of something like root vegetables, like um, beets or radishes, we just eat the root of the vegetable and we throw the whole top away. But the thing is, you know, beet tops are a really good vegetable. It's like kale or chard or collard greens or something. You can cook them perfectly fine. They're enormously nutritious. But the problem again is a cultural one. We just aren't in the habit of eating those. We don't want to eat those. So that's part of the problem. And then also, as you may know, um, only you know aesthetically pleasing fruit gets sold in supermarkets. So fruit that has like little marks on it and all generally don't get sold in supermarkets, even though they're just as good. Um, if you go to the um, the farmers market, which in Golita is on Sunday morning, there is a place that sells apples, and they have all the beautiful apples laid out. But they have another spot, and then I think they're called visually distressed, if I remember. And the apples are like half price, and because they have like little more on them at all. Um, but most people don't buy those, but I can tell you those kind of the only ones that I do buy, they are absolutely be fine to eat also. Um, so we're going to ask about the second intervention that you can make here. Let me see if I can start this. So uh, talked about personal action, the first eye clicker poll. Number two, we're going to talk about collective activism. Would you consor consider joining a group like Sunrise Movement, UCSB's Environmental Affairs Board, UCSB's Associated Students Environmental um, Justice Alliance, and a whole lot of other ones in order to help mitigate the climate crisis? So the thing is, basically the same answers as before. Yes, you've done joined one or more group. Yes, you've joined one group, which is B. You're planning on it. Um, you just don't really know for sure, or you have no intention of doing that. And um, similar to last one, but more not sure. Interesting. And a smaller group of people actually did all of that, joined one or more, and that group is a fifth of the size of the one that has no intention of doing it. Um, let me just pause on that for a moment and tell you what kind of a theme we were working through today. It's great that more that uh, more people are interested in doing personal action and all. But as we're seeing today, and we've seen throughout this course, personal action is not nearly as effective as collective activism. So for all those people who are just thinking about it, if you want to do something, yeah, what we're talking about, great. What we're talking about is great. Less food waste, plant-based diet, all that. Totally great. But if you actually want to do something, and that's your intention of doing the most you can do, of getting the most bang for the buck for your effort, then this is the way to go about it, to join a group. And many people are often confused about that, you know, because where do you join? What groups are available and all? But again, UCSB has over 40 groups on campus. You just put in your browser, UCSB Sustainability, you get there, there's a little tab that says like taking action or doing something, click that, and you'll get all these groups that you can join. And we're fortunate, as what I'm saying is, you're fortunate that there are a ton of groups on campus and whatever you're interested in, like you're interested in food, you know, we have a little farm on campus, we have the Department of Public Worms, which does composting, we have all sorts of things here. So a little plug for all that, I guess. Okay, back to the lecture. Um, the number two thing, again, not windmills, not um, solar, but is the education of women and girls and family planning together are number two. Um, we need to educate it. We need to educate more people with uteruses as well as promote family planning. Globally, there are about 85 million unattended pregnancies every year. About 30 million of them result in, result in births. Um, if you reduce these two, if you did these two things, it would roll back about 85 gigatons of um, GHG emissions. Again, bigger than wind, bigger than solar. Um, I say I put girls and women rather than people with a uterus because most of the um, the laws that prohibit um, these individuals from being educated across the planet, they single in on uh, girls and women is the way they call it. But um, the issue here is it's, it's any person, um, however they identify with the uterus. Um, you know, throughout the 20th century, there were these large scale efforts to reduce the population of the planet. 
You may have heard of them. Perhaps the most famous was the, the one child and two child policy in China um, during Mao's China in the closing quarter of the 20th. Um, and in the beginning of the 21st, too, it's been argued that because of this policy, provincial governments could and did require the use of require a uh, force, the use of contraception, abortion and sterilization to ensure compliance and impose enormous economic fines for doing so. So, yeah, for obvious reasons, this is not the approach. It was tried. It was tried in mass on millions of people and it just didn't work. So if you want to reduce the global population, which is a good thing to do, how do you go about doing that? And the answer is a much simpler solution is you educate people that have a uterus, which dramatically curves population growth as the more education a person with a uterus has, the fewer children that they have. No one has to force a person with a uterus to make this decision as it is simply their choice. So we know this statistically, if you provide more education for a person with a uterus, they'll have fewer children. If you look to the parts, places on the planet where the population um, um, growth, where the number of children is highest, this is places where each person with a uterus has on average six children. If you look at the educational levels for girls and women, that play, those countries have about a fifth grade education required. If you look to the places on the planet that have the uh, the lowest population growth, or it's actually below replacement rate, education of girls and women is very high. This even includes places like the United States. So if a person with a uterus doesn't graduate from high school, they will probably have three children on average. If they graduate from college, on the other hand, they will have fewer than two. And it just works that way, right on the way up, all the way up. So if you look at, and I, I think I mentioned this before in the first day of class, a place like Italy, which has the highest educational level for um, people that have uteruses, has, has more female PhDs than any other place in Europe. They also have the lowest uh, birth rate, in spite of the fact that the Vatican is there and the seat of Catholicism is there in Italy. So you might think that those cultural things would make a difference. They do. But education, full stop, is the thing that we need to do. So, um, and just to be very clear, so we don't get confused here, it's not to say that you should place this particular responsibility on girls and women. To the contrary, the responsibility lies with the institutions that restrict a person with a uterus have the access that they have to education and control of their own bodies. That's the problem. It's not against, this is not about individual choice. This is about a system that does not give choice to people. Um, and two, obviously, contraception is a, is a male issue as well. Um, so, so why is population so important? It's kind of obvious, but uh, 60 years ago, that's when I was born, um, global population was about 3 billion. It's now 8 billion. By 2050, it will be approaching 10 billion. So uh, it's not going to be that long till it hits 9 billion. And it may do it in my lifetime. So you're talking about a tripling of world population in a single lifetime. And it's not just that it went from like, you know, 100 million to 300 million. That would have been a problem. But now we have such a global population that it's taxing the resources of the planet. And the flip side is not only the resources being used, but then emissions are coming out that's far too great. Um, yeah, um, it's one of the main things, however, that we can do to mitigate the climate crisis is begin reducing the population of our planet. We're not sure where it's going to end, by the way. The WHO is predicting that human population will probably hit something like 12 billion um, and that will happen in this century. A lot of it depends on what we're talking about with the climate crisis. If there's a significant collapse of global world population, a significant collapse of the global civilization of our species, which some people are predicting seriously, um, then it's going to go down. So we know, for example, that when there was a, a major problem in the medieval period, uh, late medieval period with the bubonic plague, and when it hit England, for example, and we know those numbers because it's, it's a contained island community, um, population cut in half dramatically. So yeah, we're not quite sure, but it is the problem now. Um, 
So let me just go back to that. Um, just to be clear, and I'd mentioned this on the first day of class, I forget if I have a slide coming up on it, but um, this is not to suggest that population is the only issue. When people thought that, and they did like 50 years ago, 1970, there's a book that came out called The Population Bomb. Um, it's not just population, it's also how much people consume. So in the United States, we consume like 20 times more and produce like 20 times more emissions as other, you know, as some low income you know, countries in the United, in the world. So consumption is a big part of it. Eight billion people would be a lot easier to handle if they were like the poorest three or four billion people on the planet, because they're not consuming much and they're not emitting much. Eight billion people like the United States would go through the resources of this planet probably in a few years and it would end. Um, it's just that much because we consume so much. Fortunately for the planet, we're just 4% of the population. And fortunately for the planet, we have gross inequality in this country insofar as just the wealthiest people are doing most of the consumption. And even in the U.S., there are you know, low to moderate income individuals who don't, con don't consume or produce many GHG emissions. But you always have, to, you always have to think of this as a ratio. It's not just population. It's population in, also in terms of consumption and emissions. So, um, But anyhow... Top three solutions we have from Project Drawdown, reducing food waste, shifting to large food plant-based diets, educating uh, more girls and women and, and people with, uh, and providing family planning uh, for people with uteruses as well. Take these three things together and they will take us nearly a quarter of the way where we need to go to get GHG emissions under control. And as I mentioned before, but now you know what the top three are, um, these three changes would do more to draw down GHG emissions than the bottom 75 things in Project Drawdown combined. They're that big, they're huge, um, and they're all doable. Um, and the obvious thing, very little is needed by way of technology here. Necessary changes can be made right now by both individuals and a range of groups and institutions. So, yeah, I mean, better birth control technology would be good, right? Um, and I think that's obvious. And new technology to help educate more girls and women across the planet, and like remote education and all. I'm sure that's a useful component and, and kudos to anyone working on and implementing it. But all I need, mean to say is we can do this without any of that. It's all going to help, but we can do it right now. Um, but let me just go back to that. Yeah. Um, and it can be implemented, but do keep in mind, and I made this point on the first day of class, that the cultural problem in particular here is a big one. And you may not think it, but um, say so like food, you know, shift into a largely plant-based diet, it's really hard to convince people. Again, try to convince, you know, people to do that with providing education and family planning to people with the uterus, that's a huge problem, right? You may know, and we're going to talk about it there. Um, we're going to talk about when we get to the questions, the comments people made. You know, there are countries that deeply are invested in not allowing girls and women to get educated, and horrible things have been done. And I always, when I gave this lecture a few years ago, I always used to give the example of South America, where most people do, uh, people with the uterus do not have access to abortion as the um, um, thing of last resort, as the option of last resort. South America was close enough. I thought that was a good example. Um, but in the years that I've been teaching this, Roe v. Wade has now been overturned in the U.S. and the number of individuals in the U.S. who have access to abortion as the you know resort uh, as the thing of you know final resort has been reduced dramatically in North America as well. So there are people who are deeply invested in this not happening. They're not they're not standing there and saying, well, we don't want to do this for environmental grounds, but they're digging their heels in and saying, we don't want to change the way we eat. We don't want to change the way we, you know, um, deal with food. We don't want to change the way. Um, and we, we definitely want to make sure that um, women do not get as much education and that we definitely want to make sure that um, they don't get access to birth control. Yeah. Um, when you read Project Drawdown, kind of shifting the um, uh, channel a little here, 
Um, you'll notice that quite a few of the top 25 suggestions as you go down from that top three involve land use and relating to tropical forests, silvopasture, regenerative agricultural, temp agriculture, temperate forests, peatlands, and so forth. So you don't know what any of these are. Don't worry, you're in luck. You're going to find out what they all are when you read about them. Um, and in fact, 11 of the top 25 that we can do to draw down greenhouse gas emissions involve land use of one sort or another. And this may come as a big surprise of you, surprise to you. You may know, and we saw in Leonardo DiCaprio's Before the Flood, that you know it's an issue with deforestation in places like Indonesia, where they have some of the last rainforests on the planet. And you might have thought, well, yeah, that makes sense, that sort of land use is an issue. But there are all these other things that we can do. Things like silvopasture, regenerative agriculture. Silvopasture, by the way, is, you'll read about it, but it's just that um, instead of having pasture, if you're going to raise animals, especially like pigs, which don't emit nearly as much methane, or, or chickens even better, um, you raise them basically in little forests so that you have the forest there that can produce other food, right? The trees can produce like fruit or something. They also sequester CO2, and then animals just, you know, are, live beneath it and all. Um, these are things that other cultures used people knew about for thousands of years. None of this basically is new. If you look to indigenous cultures across the planet who had these sort of time-honored practices, um, it's all there. But now we're realizing that the industrial agricultural machine that we have and industrial um, use of land that we have in the West is deeply problematic, which is why people are, you know, all of a sudden looking very carefully at how other cultures um, um, had their relationship with the planet, not just in a like a spiritual way, if they're more connected to the planet, more respectful and all that. It's all good and true, but also in real, you know, uh, brass, you know, uh, nuts sort of thing. How exactly were they living? Um, and interestingly, nine of those 11 issues that involve land use also involve food production. So if you think about it, then if you add the food waste and plant based diet, 11 of the top 25, nearly half of the top 25 things that we can do to draw down and you know, greenhouse gas emissions involve food. So it's just a striking thing to think about and that most people don't. And again, most people think what we need to do is all these new technology things like solar and electric cars. They're good and they're different ways, but not like this. The way that we use the planet is huge. And it's all interconnected. It's its own kind of intersectional issue. And what I mean by that is, Okay, say, just say, take the United States as an example, we decided to stop growing um, animals for food, right? Globally, it's like 70 billion animals. We keep a herd of that many for food. But say in the US, we decided to stop doing that. Um, just say we decided to stop doing beef. Well, guess what? 40% of this continent would then get opened up because 40% of it we use to grow animal products, not just for grazing and all, but we grow soybeans, we grow other things that they eat, and that takes an enormous amount of land to grow things like oats and all. Let's just say we did away with that, but we'll take a small fraction of that land to grow things for people, and we could still do it. Like oats are a great example. Oats make a phenomenal milk substitute, a dairy substitute, in the sense of oat milk. If you haven't tried it, you should. It's environmentally one of the best milks far better than like almond or cashew milk. And um, if you haven't tried oat milk ice cream, you should try it. If you get downtown Santa Barbara to McConnell's ice cream, or you can buy it in a store, I think it'll convert you instantly to the idea that you don't need dairy milk that you can have so many things you'd have with something like, you know, oat milk. And then we'd use a little bit of that land to continue growing oats and all, but then we'd suddenly have, you know, 40% or nearly so of the continent to do these other things that would involve land use. We could remake the entire continent. We could remake the way our species lives in this particular um, part of the planet um, just by doing that. Um, and just to be clear, when you read Project Drawdown, something to note is if you're thinking about like a career path, um, how you could make an intervention. Um, this 
is an obvious thing. So the obvious thing would be the emissions there. So yeah, if you're thinking of a career path, you may not want to go into the fossil fuel industry. You may not want to work for an oil company or a coal mining company or something. But the things at the very top are going to be industries that get a lot of use. And they are already with things like solar and all. As you may know, solar installers, the people in the business of installing solar is far bigger than like people working in the coal industry right now. So as this transition happens, but on the other hand, there are all these other things that you could think about, um, even including like with the food stuff, the top, like being a chef, like there's a, if you watch the alternate film, not Cowspiracy, but the other one, Wasted, which is about food waste, you'll see there's a whole new generation of people focusing on food, including like chefs who are making food entirely differently. So use my example of like radish or beet tops there, making, you know, real delicacies out of things like beet tops and cooking that way. Okay, continue. Um, so land uh, use and food production dominates the top 25 solutions, um, but it's a diverse group of actions. So I do want you to think about it and think about just pause on what sort of things are required, what do we need to do? And again, that might be a practically interesting, uh, that might be a practical interest to you if you wanna think about a career path. Um, I'm curious to hear what you think about. We'll look at some of the initial comments. Um, and many people noted that this is really what they wanted. So the class has been, I guess, interesting in certain ways for them. But for a certain number of people, this is it. This is the this is the you know the roadmap for what we need here to globally reduce greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, here it is. Here are the numbers. It's been worked out. Now we know what to focus on. And as you know, it should be obvious to go back to that original example, the little charger that you use for your phone, that little USB charger. Yeah, that's kind of irrelevant. These are the big things ranked in order of priority. So we're going to get to the class discussion now. Same thing as usual. I may have, you know, um, cut some down a little. So first comment, when I looked through the website and, and spoke to myself, yes, this is exactly what I want, specific solutions to reduce personal carbon footprint. I feel surprised by the various actions we can take to, um, to contribute to CO2 reduction. And I also enjoyed reading it. To be honest, it, honest, I prefer to read articles and websites that give people a specific way to solve problems and guide us to the goal itself. I'm not denying the significance of raising questions or discovering issues that give people um, that already existed, but I'm saying um, that reading material that give people instructions can be more encouraging and hopeful. I grew up in China, and I am sure that our media is displaying advertisements about saving food, water, and electricity. However, um, it is not until uh, the moment that I read this week's readings that I know that there are even more things that we can do. Yeah, I think um, it's a really good point and it's great this person um, says having grown up in China it still applies here so in other words if you read through the first part of this comment and this is exactly what you were thinking this is what you've been looking for if you like hard facts like this um, yeah for people in the U.S. Um, but anywhere and I should note that many many people made this comment um, and it's interesting because if you if you listen to the news, you hear about the climate crisis almost on a daily basis. You'll hear about, you know, disastrous impacts of it, droughts, wildfires, hurricanes and so forth, political squabbling over it back and forth. You know, you're going to hear about that. And of course, climate change deniers are trying to influence the, the news as well. But what's frustrating is in terms of this reading is what little media attention is given to climate solutions. Viable climate solutions prioritize solutions. Um, and little things like switching off your light bulb is, is what get attention. So that's why I think that Project Drawdown is just so important as it lays out solutions in order of their climate impact. Hence, it's not surprising that this person exclaimed, yes, this is exactly what I want, specific solutions. Um, and I hasten to add that these things can not only help us reduce our personal carbon footprints, as this person noted, but help address changes that we can only make collectively. So one of the things you're going to see is installing offshore wind turbines. Well, you can't install your own offshore offshore wind turbine that can only be done by us as a culture. Um, and a place like California, that's really relevant. We have enormous wind resources right off the coast, but we're not taking advantage of them. 
This person makes another great point. Uh, reading materials that give, quoting there, reading materials that give people instructions can be more encouraging and hopeful than raising questions or discovering issues. I think that's right. So in other words, this is a roadmap and this is encouraging because these are the things that need to be done. This is not a morphic theory. These are specific things that need to be done, can be done, are being done. Um, but to get people to position where they're ready to do something about the climate crisis, they need to be fully aware of the severity of the problem, I think. Um, that's why we spent a good bit of time looking at the problem, but I think looking at solutions, and that's where we are at this point in the class. So if you were disturbed at the beginning of the class, it was just so many problems, it was depressing, or it was just too theoretical and all, here we're at the point where we're looking at solutions. Um, and, you know, if you're going to ask people to do something like make a change, like stop eating beef, you better have a good reason to tell them that, you know. Um, and if you have the facts of something like Project Drawdown, you can say, well, you know, that's the number two thing that's causing the climate crisis right now. This is a big thing. This is not a minor little thing. You know, this is what's keeping, you know, what's making our planet largely uninhabitable for our species. Um, yeah. And the, the important thing here is, I'm going to state the obvious, is that we can do things. We know what to do. Um, and if you do something, do anything about a problem, it's usually um, comforting in the sense that, you know, that's one of the ways of dealing with anxiety is just to do something. And if you're working toward the problem, I think that's great. And what's great about Project Drawdown, it does give us that real, real you know, roadmap for it. Next comment, it's fabulous that we have these solutions in hand to solve the climate crisis, um, but it is required for us and our government to implement these as quickly as possible to save ourselves before sinking into the mud of desperation. Yeah, that's a really good short comment, but it makes two great points. Um, first, just to be clear, we do have the solutions now. If anyone tells you we don't know what to do, um, I mean, we know what the problem is, we know what's causing it, we know what to do. So that's great. Um, many people seem to be the under impression if we mitigate the climate crisis, we're going to need new technology, right? So in that sense, they take the position, well, we don't have it yet. So um, Donald Trump very famously said, well, wind and solar might be good, but it's not mature technology. None of this is mature technology. Um, and, and it's true. The example I just gave, like offshore wind turbine, we have to work out that technology. It's, and people are working on it feverishly right now. Um, but most of these things, you know, we can do right now. We can just jump right in, as this person says, and do it. So what's standing in our way? This person nails it. You know, um, it's the problem. This person succinctly notes what is required from us and our government is to implement these largely, and most of these are cultural changes as quickly as possible. In other words, to put it, it's not that what stands between us and the solution to the climate crisis is new technology. Again, new technology is welcome and will help, but the main thing standing between us and solving this problem is us. If individually and collectively we resolve to solve this problem, we can absolutely do it. Um, and that kind of leads to this next comment, which is interesting. <sighs> Disheartening is a good way to describe the solutions list. This person had sort of the opposite uh, emotional impact on. Uh, backed by governmental and political action, implementing many of these changes would be swift and effective. By the way, I agree with that. I think that's absolutely right. How impactful would this list be if it was widely made public knowledge? It's 100% frustrating and disheartening to come to the realization that our government chooses not to act in the interest of our well being. So, yeah, two really great points here. First, effective communication and education is essential. As this person notes, you know, how impactful would this list be if made widely available to the public? And as we've seen with, you know, that book that we read part of, Why Scientists Disagree About Global Warming, climate education and um, K through 12 education in general have been really spotty. And we actually have other individuals actively presenting disinformation. So wouldn't it be great if 
this solution were available and you're presenting it to K through 12 students. Um, I can't help but note on a, a, a personal note that yesterday, gee, right about this time at 1030, I started giving a talk through sixth graders at the Montecito Union uh, School District. They asked me to come and talk to them about it. And it's just surprising that that's not required everywhere. I mean, it's this kind of education, especially when we know the answers here. Um, because many people want to do something, but they just don't know where to begin. And especially, I was so enthusiastic teaching to, talking to sixth graders because they really want to do something and they really don't know where to begin. Um, the public may not have, in, have access to this, but certainly experts and agencies do, like the EPA and all. They have access to all this information. Anyone, you, anyone has access to it if you're looking for it. But as this person notes, our government chooses not to act in the interest of our well-being, which is, as this person notes, 100% frustrating and disheartening. Yeah, so what's the answer here? First, education is just so central. Everyone should be aware of this list. This should be taught at pretty much every grade level. Um, and it should be old hat for you now. And if you encountered this, at, you know, whatever you're a freshman or senior or whatever, and if this is the first time you've encountered this collectively, there is a big breakdown here. Something's wrong. You should have known this. You should have known this like years ago, a dozen years ago. Um, and same old thing again and again and again. We need to vote in politicians to care about to, again, quote this person, our well-being rather than the well-being of the fossil fuel industry, its affiliates, and, well, other corporations. Next comment. When I looked at Project Drawdown, I assumed the solutions would be things that I've heard of, things like you should eat less meat and you shouldn't drive your car. I did not expect to see things like new solution, education of women. As a woman, this is something that I've been passionate about ever since Malala, Malalia was shot uh, for going to school. Um, many people made similar comments that they just weren't aware of any of this, um, like silvopasture, intercropping, regenerative, annual cropping, that sort of thing. Um, and again, it turns back on the issue of, of communication, since you should have been education, you should have got this before. And as this person notes, um, Malalia Yusafar, sorry, I totally got her in. My dyslexia makes that really hard. Uh, Pakistani activist advocating for women rights. Um, when she was 15 years old, you may know she was shot. There was an assassination attempt, shot in the head. And astonishingly, she survived and went on to become a, um, um, an actual activist and a Nobel uh, winner for it. Um, it's obviously an extreme example, but it makes clear that what is seemingly a simple solution, providing education for girls and women, is, is not only good for the climate, but hey, for women across the planet. Um, and it can, unfortunately, be met with fierce opposition. Uh, the same is obviously true in giving women access to contraception, which is resisted across the planet, including the United States, which the next person commented on. The most interesting solution I read about were educating girls and family planning. This is a comment. According to Project Drawdown, 225 million women in lower income countries say that they want the ability to choose whether or not um, to become pregnant, but they lack access to necessary contraception. Also, there are 62 million girls around the world not able to access an education because of economic, cultural, and safety related barriers. As a female and a Latina living in the US, I sometimes forget how hard people before me fought for something uh, for someone like me to get an education. Still, there are girls all around the world that are not given the opportunity to get a, an education. Such a great point. You know, the scope of it across the planet, hundreds of millions of women want but are denied access to education and contraception. Um, that, that's kind of too mild a way of putting it. Not that they want access, access, they need access to education and contraception. And this is, again, this is the way the laws are written, but any person with a uterus. Um, not only would they benefit by giving act, getting access to education and contraception, but the planet would benefit by it. Um, as this person aptly notes, people before me fought for someone like me, a Latina living in the US, to get education. I would add that for decades, 
activists also fought to give people with the uterus in the U.S. access to contraception and as a last resort abortion. So there are two things to note about that. First, um, the problem here is not with women. It's hundreds of millions of women clearly know what they want, education and contraception, but rather, as I noted before, the institutions that restrict their access to education and control their bodies. Second, if you're under the impression that we're going to need to largely address the climate crisis through the deployment of new and expensive technology, such as like offshore wind turbines and all, um, you may have found it heartening that education of women was number two on the list. And why? Because it's quick, easy, and inexpensive. Uh, moreover, studies have shown that actually the cost of education, if a country or a place is saying, well, the cost of education is too high, don't do it. But it actually, when those individuals enter the workforce, the economy actually is bolstered by it. So um, even if you're a very poor country, it's money well spent. You will actually get great dividends on it if you do that. Um, so what's stopping us from doing that? Well, it's these cultural things that this person is frustrated about. Um, it's being fiercely fought across the planet, giving uh, people with the uterus access to uh, family planning and girls and women, you know, education. Um, what's needed, and I think this person kind of hits it, that there was a generation of individuals that became before them ensuring that this was person um, as Latina living in US, I forget, how hard people before me fought for someone like me to get an education. Well, that fight's not over. That's the problem. Uh, I, in the US, maybe, it still has to improve dramatically. Education is unequal across the US for a range of different reasons and different communities, especially those that are already disenfranchised. But the battle is not over. And and the thing about it, which is so good, it, it is a win-win, right? If you care about these issues, if you care about education of girls and women, um, then it dovetails perfectly with caring about the planet in this case. So um, next comment, when I first checked out the site, that's the Project Drawdown site, I was a little confused, but then became very amazed. It really is a roadmap. And it makes it so easy to tell how much each of these factors is contributing to our global emissions, how much investing in it costs, and how much it can save us. Um, this is a really good point. And if you haven't looked at Project Drawdown, when you read it, look at this point. Because you're often told by politicians that addressing the climate crisis is going to be hugely expensive. We could just never uh, afford it. It's just too much money. So when the Green New Deal came out, we're going to read part of it, um, produced by AOC and a few other Democrats. The Republicans immediately did some back-of-the-napkin math and said, this will cost $93 trillion. And Donald Trump echoed that and raised it up to $100 trillion. So you'll have many people say, well, we just can't solve this because how can we pay that amount of money? It would bankrupt the country. And that was the argument made. You will hear it again and again. The Green New Deal is too expensive. It will bankrupt the country. But if you look at Project Drawdown and what the numbers they have show, it's actually cheaper to act on this now than it will be to, to deal with it later. And some of the things are really inexpensive. So if you look at uh, clean cook stoves, um, it's in the top 25. Um, Tragic Drawdown notes that around 3 billion people cook over open fires or rudimentary stoves, things like kerosene stoves and all. Um, the cooking the fuels used by 40% of humanity are wood, charcoal, animal dung, crop residue, and coal. As they burn, the areas inside of these homes have limited ventilation and they release pumes of smoke. It results in 4.3 million deaths every year. Um, and you might think, well, why is this even a big issue? Global greenhouse gas emissions, something like 2 to 5% of it come from these traditional cooking practices, which are a problem. So how much would it cost to solve that problem? About 129 to 264 billion dollars. That's that's a lot of money. And those are Project Drawdown's numbers. But what if you don't do this? What if you let it continue? What will it cost? First, millions and millions of lives because of it. Um, but Project Drawdown has run the numbers and said that it's going to cost 
just in terms of those two to five percent emission between two and four trillion dollars. So how much to solve it? Somewhere between 130 and 260 billion, but two to four trillion. In other words, to reduce the numbers in very simple terms, it's going to cost 10 to 20 times more money to solve the problems created by this issue than addressing the issue right now, which we can do dirt cheap. Um, you know, it's costing five or 10 cents on the dollar. It's, I mean, it's the best bargain going. Um, it's a terrific deal. Um, and of course, it's going to dramatically reduce human suffering. And, you know, um, this is particularly because of particulate matter inside of homes. And again, if you're concerned about, you know, situations for girls and women across the planet, unfortunately, the great majority of those 4.3 million are girls and women because they're in houses more and they're inside those inner environments that have those particulates there. And WHO says exposure is particularly high among um, young women and young children who spend most of the time in those conditions. So, I mean, if you think about this, this one issue, not only is it going to save money, not only is it dirt cheap because you can solve the problem for five or 10% of what it will be if we let it get out of hand, but it is going to be so good for so many people across the planet who, who have horrible conditions because of this. And that 4.3 million are just the people that die. And it, people, people have argued that there are See if I remember the number right. I think it's right. 880 million people on the planet right now, every day, who experience the equivalent of smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. Not because they smoke cigarettes, but because they're in houses where they're burning things like charcoal and coal. Um, that's a huge problem. And the cancer rates and all are incredible, resulting in those deaths, but also in enormous disease and suffering. So next comment, it was great to finally uh, see among all the false theories surrounding climate change and global warming that there are still genuine climate scientists out there who are still fighting to get the real message out about the climate crisis to the public and make them more aware of what's truly going on in the world around them. It's because of well knowledge, uh, knowledgeable and well respected climate scientists such as those um, since these issues of climate change continue to surface and inspire new generations of people who rise up and tackle the climate crisis as a whole. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree any more with that. Um, and just to be clear, I know a lot of times in this class and, you know, I shift to cultural solutions rather than technological or science, but we clearly owe an enormous debt of thanks to those individuals, um, you know, and think about that. I mean, even a, we often think like, the people doing this work are important because one, they produce technological solutions, more efficient solar cells, or because they predicted the climate crisis and know what to affect. Um, it was the scientists who did these numbers here, and not just you know um, people working in the natural sciences, social sciences as well. That's who compiled this information from Project Drawdown. So it's 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 enormously you know, important that they've done that. So yeah, shout out to them. Um, Next comment, uh, 11 out of the 25 solutions are related to food and land use. This just shows how important it is for us to monitor and regulate what we are consuming and how our food is getting on our plates. Restorative, regenerative, and conservation agriculture are the three most important ways farmers should shift to reduce CO2 emissions. That's right. Most of the solutions, however, are not things that I can personally do right now. I cannot switch to wind power, solar power, and nuclear power um, when I'm currently living on campus. I cannot shift, um, I cannot implement agricultural practices or improve my rice cultivation methods. It's a little frustrating knowing this up to the people in power and control of our energy and agricultural solutions. Um, yeah, I love that point about you can't change your individual rice cultivation methods. Um, and this is a problem. So. Um, if you look at like the cost of a Big Mac, I think I've mentioned this, say it's $5. People have looked at this book and uh, looked at this, their book's been written about it. If you actually were paying the cost of that Big Mac, what it really cost, it would be like 13 bucks. Um, there are billions of dollars that are subsidized by the United States government. That's not only to like the beef industry directly, but it's like healthcare subsidiaries and, and a range of things. So whenever, even if you're, you know, if you don't buy um, any 
if you eat a vegan diet, it doesn't matter. You're paying, you know, eight dollars of that Big Mac cost. We all are as taxpayers, and it's frustrating that we have these enormous subsidies we make to the agricultural and healthcare sector. Um, but it's primarily to do things, and you'll see this with Cowspiracy, like to fund the beef industry and all. Um, so, yeah, you can personally switch to a plant-based diet, but you're not addressing any of that. You're not addressing any of those, you know, subsidies. subsidies. Um, and that makes clear, another example, it brings us back to activism. Um, personal change, being a vegan is not going to solve that problem by itself. Um, we need to put people into positions of power, the people who are actually doling out those money to the agricultural sector, not to give it to problematic industries like the beef industry at $400 million, but rather to focus on the kind of regenerative agriculture that this person is talking about, restorative, regenerative, and conservation agriculture. So great point. Uh, Project Drawdown allowed me to better understand the amount of change humanity can make in restoring the Earth and ultimately combat the climate crisis. Being able to visually see both the economic and environmental impact um, that will take to change the course. Good. Past readings and videos have often left me thinking that it's too late to act, yet I feel like these upcoming years will be the most vital in reversing the crisis. That's absolutely right. Um, so, uh, you know, we should have acted on this decades ago. We knew so much of this decades ago. We knew this when I was your age. I knew it when you were, I was your age. It was out there in the public, um, but we didn't. Um, but so there's no use of, you know, crying over spilled milk. I mean, um, and that should be obviously plant-based milk, like, you know, oat milk. Um, but there is still time to act. Um, and we should, of course, welcome new technologies. And let me go for, oh, we're done. Oh, wait. Um, yeah. Okay. So we'll do the um, iClicker poll. There you go. So here's the final question. First question, personal action. Second, collective activism. This is, um, do you vote? Do you intend to vote? Um, is voting for someone who's going to address the climate crisis a top priority for you? Is it going to enter your thinking? You're not going to vote at all? Where do you stand? Well, wow, people answered this question so quickly. Yes, what a rewarding answer. Most people say it's the top two, that it will be a primary or up there in thinking about what you're going to do when you vote. Okay, see you on Thursday.